The sermon for the third Sunday after the Epiphany is from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 uh, to 30. The sermon is entitled, The Epiphany is the Word. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, throughout the season of Epiphany, we, we hear the revealing of who Christ is, right, from the Baptism of the Lord, as the heavens opened, we hear the words, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Even at the wedding of Cana, we hear Jesus' mother saying, do whatever, he, do whatever he tells you, as this would be the first of many signs, as the Lord would manifest all of his glory. And the epiphany of our Lord was in full swing as his identity was revealed by those around him. But today, in our gospel text, hear straight from the mouth of Jesus, he proclaims the word of the epiphany to you. As God's grace, the word made flesh, made its way into the world, as Jesus says, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Because what you hear is the epiphany, the revealing of the word which Jesus is our Lord who has come to accomplish your salvation for you. There is the unrolled the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. There our Lord unleashed the anticipation, the floodgates of His grace. Remember, these words from this scroll were given 700 years before the Word became flesh. And there that day, fast-forwarding to this advent of Christ, here by His very lips, out of His mouth, the Word was fulfilled. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captive and recovering of sight to the blind, to set the liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Right there as He was reading this very word, Jesus was saying, What I say I will do. These are the words of the epiphany, the dawning of the new day, the breaking in of the new era of salvation. Yes, like any president that is sworn into office, they always give an inauguration speech where there the objectives are laid out, the plans, the hopes, that is, if all things go well. I don't know why I'm chuckling, but if both parties get along, of course, if everything just seems, all these puzzle pieces, all the stars align and in hopes that this would be accomplished. Yet for the Lord, it wasn't a speech that was surrounded by ifs but rather a speech that the Father's will will be done. And as they were listening to this inauguration speech, they, they listened, but yet they wondered as skepticism and doubt slowly peered into their hearts and minds, isn't this Joseph's son? Of course they were thinking, I mean, we know this Jesus, He's one of our own, our hometown in Nazareth. We know who he is. Well, if that skepticism wasn't enough, it, it even grew more. As they heard Jesus' word, but yet they still wanted something different than those very words read from the scroll. They wanted the Capernaum Jesus. They wanted the miracles. They wanted the glitz and the glamour, the prosperity. They wanted this instant gratification before their very eyes. They wanted Jesus in a different way. 
And though the Lord had proclaimed the way in their very midst in this synagogue, they wanted a different Jesus. And here we see their true colors, don't we? That no prophet is acceptable in his own hometown. And there Jesus, well, he, he gave them words that they indeed did not want to hear. Jesus refers to Elijah. He also refers to Elisha, both instances that catered to outside of Israel. Whether it was a famine or leprosy, this was a cause of great offense to those hearers that day, and therefore they rejected him. They rejected the Christ. Now, Jesus spoke and gave them the most gracious and liberating word that was for them. The greatest word that they needed to hear. Yet they dismiss this word as they fail to see in their true colors, right? Their true bondage and captivity and sin and death. They fail to see their true colors of, of their true disease, of spiritual bankruptcy, separated from God. It's almost as if they were saying to Jesus, sounds good, Jesus, but we want something else, as if, as if there is something better than being set free from captivity. Simply put, they wanted Jesus on their own terms. And we find ourselves doing the same, don't we? Because on our own terms, we, we crave to be the center. And friends, the shift is so subtle, isn't it? That shift to becoming the center? Quicker than a blink of an eye to see this deceptive shift of the flesh, of our sin, and there the devil is shifty tempting us, luring us, even to the point of being offended by God and His Word. Just as the people that day rose and drove Him out of the town in hopes of throwing Him off the cliff. Think about that. They failed to see the true epiphany of what was before them. The Word made flesh. And friends, we too are not immune Rather than being humbled in the mirror of the law, there in our own little gods, we exalt ourselves, self-centered, self-seeking, as we search for our self-gods, that we yield to our self-demands in our own time, in our own plan, in our own will, and even in our own way. This vat of selfishness stirs so quickly and to no surprise, even there at Nazareth that day and even now, how it has become a melting pot of how we want God on our own terms. You see, this is what binds us. And it's easy, well, to fail, to see. But here we are in the Word. And the Word of God works on you this day, showing you what the real struggle is. The struggle that this world will never tell you, but by this Word that is living and active, there we are shown our true colors, the nature of our sin for what it really is, rebellious we are, and how easy we turn to our own allegiances, our bellies, our wisdom, our stiff-necked stubbornness, as if we know better than God. And of course, you and I both know that is not true. But yet when we look at our thoughts, words, and deeds, how they reveal something very drastically different. And right now, as you listen and hear God's Word working on you, There you hear the words of hope. Yes, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, like a dove descending on him, the anointed one set apart to do what only Christ does, and that is to proclaim and give you the good news to the poor, to the broken, and that is for you. 
Now that day in Nazareth, Jesus spoke these very words, but yet they failed to see their true spiritual problem ever since the fall. The question is, do you see your own brokenness? Do you see the poverty of your own flesh? Yes, we can play the charade. We in our pride try to decorate ourselves with this self-righteousness masquerading in our own arrogance, telling ourselves and showing others, I am well to do. I have it all together. I am sufficient in myself. I need no one but my three little gods, me, myself, and I. But in the midst of this runaway train of this unholy trinity, there our Lord gives you His word, proclaiming to you the law, screeching this road to a halt by the call of repentance, showing you the mirror, diagnosing you the greatest disease that is of your sin and the poverty of your spirit. And Jesus was sent for the captives to set them free. So for you and I, in, in captivity of sin and death, there is no freedom by human effort. Our merits, our own worth, our own will, no, we are dead in our sin. We are caught behind iron bars these shackles of sin, and we reside with no rescue, no hope within ourselves. Yet Jesus speaks to you the greatest and most delivering word, the epiphany of the word, what Jesus says he will do. And on that day, on that brow of the hill, preparing to throw him off the cliff, Jesus went away, not because he was afraid, but rather, he knew the exact death that he was to die. And it was not on that day. And if that wasn't humiliating enough to be in your hometown as people want you dead, if that wasn't humiliating enough, Calvary proves greater. Yes, the crowds rejected Christ that day, but this was only a glimpse of what was to come. In his ultimate rejection, yet our Lord does not turn around because his work is for each and every one of you. No, yes, the hour is at hand. Not that time, but the hour of the cross. And our Lord fulfills this for you. That even in the midst of rejection, our Lord is faithful and just. And he cleanses you of all of your unrighteousness. That even in the midst of rejection, he does not backtrack or he does not live on lip service. No, Jesus, the epiphany is the word, the ironclad word of God, trustworthy unto all eternity as the anointed one. His time, his hour was at Calvary's cross for you that these words from the scroll would unroll as he would be lifted high upon that tree for you where the good news was published, not with ink and pen, but with his very blood written, writing your name in the book of life. Those who are broken and heavy laden, there this blood covers you by the life-saving work of the gospel. And this is not an if, right? This is not an if all things go well, this will happen. No, this is your word today, the objective truth. That what he spoke in Nazareth that day is also for you. Right now, as you hear and listen to these very words. Oh, but pastor, I, you don't know me. I'm, I'm spiritually drowned and bankrupt. Surely Jesus wouldn't forgive me of my past due overloaded debt of sin. Because pastor, I deserve nothing at all. Of course, the devil is your greatest teleprompter, giving you the words of doubt. Yet our Lord says, I have come to give you 
and deliver you the greatest news, that by my very blood you are forgiven of all your sins, all of them you are forgiven. No longer poor, but through the blood sacrifice of Christ, you are lavished with His riches of grace. No longer empty. No longer full of questions, but yet full of answers. Covered by His promise, the word of the epiphany. And this epiphany for you is the resurrection. No longer captive, no longer spiritually impoverished, no longer left in the dark and spiritual blindness. As a grave, Jesus sees and destroys and overcomes for you, proclaiming you victory over sin and death, and of course, the crushing triumph over the evil foe himself. That is what you are hearing right now. The very scroll to which Jesus read that day in Nazareth, as the scripture had been fulfilled in your hearing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of Christ. And hearing his word today, right now, the most important time of your week, right at this very moment, this word sets you truly free. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Praise be to thee, O Christ, because your word is fulfilled. We live in a world, we know what it is like today. Yet here in the word, praise be to thee, O Christ, because your will is done. And that is a fact for you. That you are forgiven of all your sins. All has been answered for. Your death has been answered for. No, long, no longer do we tell ourselves, I guess we'll see what will happen, or I hope I've done enough. No. Today, the scripture is fulfilled. All has been finished for you. And therefore, you are forgiven of your sins. For the scripture has been fulfilled. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise.